Okay, hello everyone. Hope everyone can hear me. So, thank you. Uh, welcome back to the lectures. So, um, before we start today's lecture, I um, pasted the potential list of course project into the chat window. So everyone can click on that. Um, you know, finally, uh, it's almost done um, with, uh, you know, maybe a little bit tweaks, um, which, you know, won't be major. So I think everyone should feel free to now start really seriously thinking about your course project for this course, uh, started to form groups, um, be more active on Piazza, find your uh, uh, group mates. Um, and yeah, any questions regarding the course projects? Uh, by the way, you're free to come up with your own course projects, but please contact me as soon as possible. I can add your projects to the list and you will able to find your um, group mates. So, um, you know, very br brief introduction about the potential list of projects. Um, I tried to give a more concrete description of each of the projects, but of course, you know, if you find, um, for example, uh, the direction that I propose in the description is not necessarily exactly, uh, you know, the direction you wanted to go, but you also are interested in this project, uh, that is fine. You can, you know, uh, that is why we have the proposal. Uh, you can justify your direction uh, by submitting the proposal. Um, and you can, you know, read a few papers, uh, summarize them, and convince me why you think that's a better direction. Okay, so right now, I think there are 14 projects. Um, some of the projects actually could be, uh, you know, could, could go to different directions. So I would say edit, maybe more than 14 projects um, in total. Okay. Well, so if there's no questions, we'll go back to our lecture. So I have a question. Okay. Um, at, uh, are we going to go over the requirements for the proposal at, at some point? Yeah, so I think I kind of go, uh, went through the requirements very briefly uh, in the first lecture, but I can very briefly go over it again. Uh, sure, that, that would be helpful. Yes. So, I mean, you know, let me just clarify again, the course project has really convinced me that you've learned something from the course and you've used that, uh, you know, you, you are able to use what you've learned to a project, right? So as long as you convince me that, um, you're good to go. In terms of the immediate deadline for everyone, uh, which is the proposal deadline, uh, I want everyone to have a, at least show me that you've already seriously considered which project you want to work on and you've also read some papers showed me that uh, you know you have to show me in your proposal that you've understand this topic you've understand um you've have a you've had a general idea about what direction you want to go um and you've already found your group group mates okay so that's you know the major purpose of this proposal okay thank you there is no like concrete requirement about, you know, for example, you have to write like five pages. No, I would say, you know, two pages is, you know, pretty much what I was looking for. Um, and in, in terms of like the format, of course, you wanted to use LaTeX, you wanted to have a very clear description of what you read, you wanted to lay out your plans clearly, but really there is no uh, very strict format you have to follow. Thank you. No problem. Okay, so yeah, so I don't have a very strict requirement in terms of the format, but more important, I want everyone to find the group mates, find the project and figure out the direction to go. Okay, so let's go back to our lecture today. 
as we promised last time, we will be finishing up finally the concentration bounds, uh, you know, finishing up the martingale inequalities, and finally we'll uh, come to pack learning. Okay, so martingale inequalities, let's recall the definition of the martingale sequence. So if you have a sequence of sigma fields that are nested, um, so for example, in do martingale, the sigma fields are generated by the first k variables, um, you know, x1 through xk. So that is a, a you know, special case. A lot of martingales could be, um, you know, could be having. So why k, k from one to infinity is a sequence of random variables measurable with respect to the sigma field, respectively, which is known as why k, k from one to infinity is adapted to the filtration. Okay, so once you have that, then the definition of the martingale sequence is simple. Basically, uh, you know, if you have such a sequence that's adapted to this filtration, then this pair of yk, fk, it's going to be a martingale for all k greater than or equal to one. Um, only if expectation of the absolute value of the sequence, any entry of the sequence, any element of the sequences bounded. So the expectation is bounded. And more importantly, the expectation of the next uh, random variable conditioned on the fil filtration, uh, conditioned on fk, right? So I don't want it to call it filtration here. Sorry, that's a, a mistake. I should call it fk because, you know, the sequence of fk k from one to infinity is the filtration, but itself fk is not. So expectation of yk plus one conditioned on fk K is YK. So basically means that if you know the history and the expectation of the future condition on the history is the current value. Okay. So note, notice that this FK is the um, sigma field and YK plus one as well as YK are random variables or consecutive, uh, you know, uh, random variables in this sequence. Right, so again, to remind everyone, the martingale difference sequence is the difference between yk and yk minus one. Sometimes you would say, uh, it would denote it as dk, all right, because it's a difference sequence. So here, actually, uh, last time we've already seen a construction of a dupe martingale, and it's a very important class, so I wanted to show that again and to show why it is a martingale. So recall that the dupe sequence is constructed this way, right? So you have fk equals to expectation of any function as long as it's bounded, expectation is bounded. So, you know, expectation of the function conditioned on the previous random variables, x1 to xk, because this is yk, so you're conditioned from x1 to xk. Of course, similarly, if it's yk minus one, you're conditioned on x1 to xk minus one. Um, okay, so, you know, suppose that your expectation of these functions are um, bounded, so we claim that this yk is a martingale with respect to xk, and this is indeed a dupe martingale. So how do we prove it? Remember, we have to prove, you know, a martingale, in order to show it as a martingale, we have to prove two properties, right? One is the expectation of the uh, entries in this sequence has to be bounded. The second is that the conditional expectation of the future is the current. So in terms of the first property, indeed, if you use the shorthand notation, uh, x1k, let me just, you know, don't, uh, I, I don't want it to say is subscript one super square k, let me just say x1k. So x1k is the entire sequence of the history from time one to time k. Well, in, indeed, sometimes it's not necessarily time, but let me just use time um, for simplicity of the explanation here. Okay, so x1k is the history. And then we have expectation of absolute value of yk. Again, you know, this is just the towel property of the conditional expectation. You can see it is going to be expectation of this 
absolute value of the conditional expectation. What is the conditional expectation? It's conditional on x, 1, k, the history until k, okay? All right, so once you, just, you see that, then it's very clear to see that it's gonna be smaller than equal to the expectation of the absolute value of fx. And if, of course, you know, by definition, it is gonna be bounded. So of course, now, uh, you can see this is easy to prove basically using Jensen's inequality. Um, but the second property, which is, you know, the, the um, conditional expectation of the future being equal to current. So here is the proof also very simple, again, using um, the tower property. Okay, so first we can, we can see this, right? Let me notate here. So expectation of yk plus one conditional x one k, right? Uh, so is equal to this expectation of the conditional expectation, what is it? So the first expect, you know, the outer expectation is conditioned on x one k, okay? All right, so which means that there is no randomness from x1 to xk, okay? Is that clear? So now what's within this, within this expectation is this conditional expectation is expectation of fx conditioned on x1 to xk, plus one. So can someone tell me why this is an equality? Why yk plus one conditioned on, you know, why, why expectation of yk plus one condition on x one k is equal to this expectation of expectation? Uh, this is basically an integral. So you're just combining the integrals into one integral. Okay, so yeah, that's true, but maybe we can have a more uh, concrete, uh, like, you know, like a very more detailed e explanation. Anyone else want to try? Can you just plug in for, y, for the definition of y k plus one? Mm -hmm. Yeah, true, right? So basically, if you just plug in this x one k plus one, and xk1, um, you can see that, um, so first of all, this expectation here would make sure that you don't have randomness from x1 to xk, right? Now, um, this random variable would have a randomness on what? x1 through a plus one for the inner one, right? Or yeah, just k plus one. Yeah, you have randomness from x1 to k plus one, right? But somehow you are conditioned on the, so the randomness is on what? xk plus one. xk plus one, okay? So if, you know, from the randomness, you can see that this one also only have randomness for xk plus one, do you see? Of course, this doesn't, you know, uh, directly justify why the equality is here, but you can see what's the randomness. Okay. Yep. Okay, all right, so do I need to um, prove this or that's fine? If there's any questions, please ask that on Piazza. I'm sure your peers will be able to answer that for you, okay? All right, so now, um, again, you know, this is simple to understand. Uh, you know, if you um, have this double expectation, then uh, it ended up being like the expectation of fx and uh, condition on x, 1k, and that is the definition of the yk, all right? So you can see that then this second property is satisfied. So it is a martingale. Okay. All right. 
So what does this tell us? This dupe construction basically says that, you know, if you have a sequence of independent random variables, okay, and you know, you can just construct a dupe martingale using expectation of any function, any bounded function fx conditioned on x1 through xk. That seems to be a very powerful result, right? So you can basically get the nice properties of the martingale by doing this simple construction. Okay, so this is going to be very important. I want everyone to remember this dupe construction um, because it's going to be very useful for um, you know later purposes. For example, optimization uh, for um, you know uh, for example empirical distribution estimation and things like that. So I will um, I will give an example uh, soon, uh, hopefully in today's lecture, to show you why. Uh, martingales are very important, but you know, for a for a you know IID random variables at random variable sequence, this is a way of constructing a martingale, a very simple way. Usually, you know, for 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 using martingale properties, the most difficult part is to construct a martingale. All right, so this gives you a very nice um, example of how to con construct one. All right, so here is a example. I'm going to go through this very quickly because I've already uploaded it last time. So this is an example of partial sum as a martingale. So you have a sequence of IID random variables, xi, xk's, of course, uh, and they have mean mu. Okay, so this is a little bit different than before. You have a little bit more information, you have mean mu, and you define the partial sum as just, you know, the previous the, the, all the, the summation of the previous random variables. So from one to K, right? So SK is summation from one to K of XJ. Now you define, um, again, the sigma field generated from these sequence of random variables. So uh, as we said, you know, it's just a canonical sigma field. So the random variable X, SK is measurable with respect to FK. And we have that expectation of SK plus one condition on FK is nothing but expectation of XK plus one plus SK, right? This is nothing but a definition of the SK plus one. So here, this is nothing but a definition, right? And then the sigma field is nothing but just the canonical variables. So it's X1 to XK. All right, so this is easy. Now, how do we get this, right? So you can see that because of the independence, right? Because these are independent random variables. So you get, you know, this, this, you know, so, so this part is gonna be expectation of XK plus one condition on X1 to XK, they're independent. So you don't need this condition. So it is simply just expectation of XK plus one. And the second one, SK, you know, since you've determined X1 through XK, so the expectation of SK is just itself because it's already determined, all right? So it becomes expectation of XK plus one plus the SK itself, all right? So what is the mean? As we know, it's, the mean is mu, so it's gonna be mu plus SK. So what does this tell you, right? This tells you that you know, while the sequence itself is not a martingale, right? Because you don't have the expectation of X, uh, SK condition on FK is just, sorry, you don't have the uh, property of expectation of SK plus one conditioned on FK is SK. Rather, you have the shift turn here. However, so this is what I mean by sometimes you wanted to construct the sequence a little bit. However, oh, sorry, what did I do? Okay, however, if you recenter the variable yk to be sk minus k mu, okay, so if you do that, then actually this becomes a martingale sequence with respect to xk. Okay, Um, sorry, so David has a question. It's not independence. It's just a linearity of the expectation that splits. Yes, for splitting the sum, yes. 
but also there is, you know, uh, so if you split them, there is this expectation of x k plus one condition on x one to x k, right? That requires independence yeah. for it to be expectation of x k plus one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So actually, Yue Ling already answered the question. Okay. Awesome. Okay, so we don't have any questions here. This is just an example of how you can use a partial sum to construct a martingale. All right, so likelihood ratio, again, I'll very quickly go through this. Um, so it is very important for analyzing stopping rules for sequential hypothesis testing, right? So what does that mean? Basically wanting to test the likelihood ratio. So if you have F and G, to be mute, two mutually continuous densities, right? So, and you net the X case to be a sequence of random variables, IID, right? According to F. So X is drawn from F, right? But they're IID. So if you let the Y N, so you construct a sequence to be the product of the ratio. So it's G conditioned on F and the product is over K, right? So G of X K, F of X K, the ratio, uh, be the likelihood ratio based on the first n samples, All right? So, you know, it is y, y n is just the first n sample ratios, product of the ratios. Then the sequence y k is gonna be a martingale with respect to x k. So why is that? Um, very simply, you can see that the expectation of the y k plus one, uh, y n plus one, sorry, uh, yeah, it doesn't matter. You can use K or you can use N uh, as long as you're consistent. Expectation of Y N plus one condition on X one to X N is gonna be expectation of this ratio multiplied with the product of the ratio. Okay, so why is that? First of all, the definition of the YN is this one, right? So this is the ratio. Then, of course, the YN plus one is gonna be the ratio uh, until N plus one product. All right, this is easy, right? Again, because of the independence, right? So, you know, uh, the YN plus one should be so basically expectation of YM plus one conditioned on X1, XN. So basically you have, you have a fixed value for X1 to XN. So therefore anything that is related to, anything that's before XN is gonna be outside of the expectation because it's already fixed, right? So then the expectation is obviously only uh, on the ratio of x m plus one. However, you know, the condition would again be gone because x m plus one is conditional independent with, sorry, it's not conditional, it's just independent with all the previous variables, x one to x n. So therefore you have just the expectation of the g x m plus one uh, divided by f x n plus one. And then the other things are just outside of the expectation. And what is it? It is nothing but just a YN, right? Why? Because the expectation of the G uh, XN plus one divided by F XN plus one is just one, just because they are densities, okay? So again, you can see the likelihood ratio could be also formed as a martingale and then using martingales uh, later on we'll see some you know a very important martingale inequalities to help you understand the perturbations of these sequences so now finally uh, we're here bounding sums of um, mds martingale difference mar martingale difference sequence so using Azuma's inequality here, actually I'm using Azuma Hofting's inequality. So again, let's recall, uh, yeah, okay. 
So let's recall the definition of the martingale difference sequence. It is, you know, if you have a martingale sequence xk, then the difference, you know, dk defined as xk minus xk minus one is the martingale difference sequence. Just a recall of the definition. So we're going to provide a bound for some of the martingale difference sequence um, using like a Hofting style uh, inequality. So what does that mean? So let's say you have, again, you know, D, let the, the uh, pair of dk, fk, k from one to infinity to be a martingale difference sequence. So again, you know, uh, this fk is just the sigma field that these martingale is adapted to. So, and suppose that this absolute value of the different sequence, dk, any entry of that sequence, dk, uh, absolute value is bounded by bk. So you have an upper bound, the value cannot go above bk and can not go smaller than minus bk. So almost surely for all k greater than one, then for all t, so t is again the perturbation. So the pro, the um, the first of all, I wanted to ask everyone, what is the expectation of dk? Yeah, since we're talking about half things inequality, remember uh, what do we require? Yeah, exactly, it's zero, right? Because of the definition of the martingale, the expectation of martingale difference sequences is going to be having a zero mean. So here, what does this mean? This basically means that it's a deviation from the mean, right? Although I'm omitting the zero here, but really you can, can, you can think of this as like minus zero, right? Within the absolute um, sign here. So is the perturbation greater than t. So it's like, you know, the summation of the different sequence uh, deviate from its mean. Okay, so it is greater than or equal to t. Um, and this probability, so this probability of the deviation greater than t is going to be upper bounded by an exponential. Right, what is the exponential? It is again just a Hofting inequality. If you recall Hofting inequality, this is a trouble application of that sum of random variables okay so any questions here notice that we are not using one minus n here okay if we have one minus n then it will be a little bit different but we already talked about it last lecture so i don't want it to repeat it here okay so any questions all right so which th this is, you know, a very um, introduction of the Azuma Hofting inequality from the perspective of a martingale difference sequence. But can we do it from a uh, perspective of a martingale sequence? So indeed, you know, the corresponding inequality for a martingale sequence is also uh, easy to get from this theorem five. So actually, I'm also calling calling it theorem five because they are essentially talking about the same thing. So let, again, so now xk is not a different sequence, but is the martingale itself, right? So you have this martingale sequence. And now notice that you have a special requirement that x zero is gonna be zero, okay? Uh, of course, this, you know, difference is also bounded. So this is almost corresponding to like this dk absolute value is bounded, okay, with bk. Again, almost surely for rk, then now the part, the um, deviation, right, so now it's actually not the deviation, but only because the summation of the dk would give you xk, uh, x, uh, the summation of the dk k from 1 to n would give you what? give you what? Yes, exactly. So this is going to be xn, right? Because, you know, uh, the intermediate terms will cancel out because you're using like a different sequence. Okay, so this is somehow very interesting. 
right? So now the expect the summation of the DK is going to be XK. So it is going to be bounding the absolute value of the sequence itself. Okay. So you can bound how, you know, basically you can bound the value of the sequence using here, this inequality here. Okay, so expo exponential of the minus 2t squared divided by summation of bk squared. Okay, so this is a very interesting result. Basically, this Azuma Hofting inequality, you know, sometimes people started with this and they were a little bit, you know, confused why this is a Hofting style, but really because. You know, we are essentially applying Hofting inequality on this martingale difference sequence rather than the martingale sequence. Um, so we get this one. But it's the same as this um, inequality on the x, x and its itself. Questions? So we'll see an example here. Um, Convergence of empirical distributions to the true distribution of random variables. Here, I will give an example of what we will, you know, need to do in machine learning tasks a lot. Suppose we have a distribution function f, you know, of course, is unknown, right? What you can do is you can get iid sequences or so-called samples from it. So let's say you get sample x1, x2, xn. You can imagine this is this is indeed like your training samples or training examples, right? I call it the entire collection as a sample, and then each of them is going to be an example. So you have x1 through xn, which are drawn from this unknown distribution f. So now from the sample x1 through xn, we can build so-called an empirical distribution function. How would you do that? Any ideas? So here is how you would do that. It's very simple. What do you do? You basically, the empirical distribution function is going to be a function uh, with a variable x. So for any x, you would compute the average frequency of, or you can first see how many of the examples are smaller than x. OK? And then you take the average. This is gonna be a, this is gonna be the frequency. So what does this tell you? Basically, is the frequency of observing values at most x in our sample. Okay. Questions? Okay. I would assume no. So it is going to be a random function because you know the value really depends on the sample, right? For a different sample, the f and x is going to be different. So it is still a random function, depends on the sample. Does this, does this make sense? Right, for example, you have uh, seen examples one, two, one, three, four, one, zero, five. These are your, so, you know, for simplicity, your uh, random variables are actually just one dimensional. So it's just a scalar. So you have, you know, x1 equals to one, x2 equals to two, x3, one, x4, three, and so on. Now, so what is your fn of x? It's going to be a function um, you know, with an input variable x, right? So, for example, for x equals to, let's say, um, for x equals to minus one, what is it? Yeah, it's gonna be zero, right? Because there is nothing greater, or uh, smaller than minus one. So it's going to be zero. Now, if x is zero, what is it? Yeah. 
one over eight, right? Because there is one sample that is greater, a smaller, so, you know, that is smaller than equal to zero, right? So what about x equals to one? Oh, four, sorry, four. Four over eight is gonna be one over two, right? And so on. So this is your so-called empirical distribution function. Just a very simple example here, okay? Is that clear to everyone? Okay, so this is like a very trivial way of doing this estimation of the distribution using your sample. Now, in statistics and machine learning, a common question is how good is this empirical risk, right? So you wanted to use this empirical risk. Basically, you know, let's say you have an LN, okay? So LN is defined as a uh, function dependent on X1, Xn, dependent on the sample. So what is it defined? It's actually the supremum of the absolute value difference between fnx and fx. So what is fx is the true distribution, okay? What is fnx is your empirical distribution function. So you want to evaluate how closely your empirical distribution function estimates your true distribution. Does that make sense? So that's why you wanted to you know, estimate the supramount because, you know, any perturbation along any point are very important. Therefore, you just take the maximum perturbation to evaluate how good this empirical risk is. Right? So, indeed, what we need to do, we need to bound probability of absolute value of Ln minus expectation of Ln, okay? So, so let me ask you, what is the randomness? What is the expectation on? Any idea of, you know, what, what, what is the expectation on? Laura asks a question, are there different metrics for empirical risk or is that the definitive way to measure it? So I think there might be other ways of defining empirical risk. I think here I'm just using a very simple example. But, um, you know, anyone want to comment on what is the expectation of? What is the randomness here? That just be in terms of x1 through xn? True. So that means, you know, the randomness is the sample, right? You can sample many different samples from the distribution. Okay. Do you see what I mean? Here I said it is going to be a random function. It depends on the sample. So if I sample a different sample, so it means like a different data set, again, from the same distribution, so you wanted to take expectation over that, okay? Okay, so first let's define, so it is a little bit complicated here, but I think it's very well worth mentioning and probably give you guys an idea of how martingales could be a little bit complicated. But, you know, after learning this, hopefully we will get a better understanding when we read papers that use martingales. Okay, so let's say here I wanted to define M0 as the expectation of Ln. I'm going to define M1 as the expectation of Ln conditioned on sigma x1. I'm going to define Mn as the expectation of Ln conditioned on sigma x1 through xn. So what does this remind you? We've just learned about this sequence. What does this remind you?
Does this remind you Duke Martingale? Okay, yes, dupe construction, true. So now, um, okay. Now, of course, you know, it's not very surprising. This is a martingale. And we know that changing one coordinate xi to some xi prime actually changes fm by at most one over n. Can you see why? Why is that? Because if you change xi to xi prime, right, whatever you change, it would only change this indicator function of whether being one or zero, right? So either you can change it from zero to one, or you can change it from one to zero, uh, but the summation is going to be changing only one, okay? Either plus one or minus one. But of course, the f and x is also scaled by one over n. So indeed, you cannot change for more than one over n. Okay, so that's a very simple argument here. Now, what does this mean? This basically means that, you know, if your fn cannot be changed for more than one over n, then similarly, because of this is how you construct ln, ln can only change by at most one over n as well. Okay? because it's the supermon of the difference between f and x and minus uh, fx. So fx is fixed. f and x can change at most by one over n. Of course, the supermon cannot change from more than one over n, okay? So now, what can you see? You can see that uh, based on the definition, right? The, the definition of these mks, you can see that the mks can actually be denoted as the integral of the ln. And what is that? This is just like, you know, integrating over the probabilities, distributions of the x k plus one all the way through xn. Okay? This is by definition. Why? Because you've already, you know, fixed x1 through xk. So therefore, you only need to take the integral based on the, condi the, you know, the definition of the conditional expectation. You only need to take the integral uh, for xk plus 1 through xk, xn, sorry. Okay. So what does this tell you? This basically means that the difference between this Martingale sequence absolute value is going to be upper bounded by this quantity here because we know that ln is going to be changed at most by 1 over n so you can just upper bound it by 1 over n right now again taking the integral over these uh, you know when this thing becomes 1 so it is going to be just 1 so it's just the entire probability. So it's the marginalization over this xk plus 1 to xn. What is k? k is just like one index. So, you know, it's from, you know, it k be, can be 1 to n. So it's just a like index. So once you have that, what you can see is if you define the, you know, mk as some shifted version of, sorry, if you define mk hat as a shifted version of mk, then mk hat is going to be a martingale with difference bounded by 1 over n. Then what you can do is basically you can see you can use the Azuma's inequality to get this probability, uh, to this to get this perturbation probability. So this will tell you how, you know, how to bound 
the empirical. So how good your empirical asked, how good your empirical risk estimate the true distribution? Am I losing people? <laughs> any questions? We can pause a little bit here to answer any questions we have. So can you repeat what uh, f of x is without the subscript n? Oh, f of x is just a distribution, right? So right. It's, it's, okay. uh, is the is here is the distribution f? Um, so it's gonna be like f of x, right? All right. So yeah. we're just trying to approximate the dis the true distribution. Yeah, which is unknown, but the true distribution. Right. Okay. Right, so the empirical distribution function is gonna use the sample to estimate that true distribution, okay? So what am I trying to say here? I'm trying to say that you can use martingale. So I'm using martingale inequality as an example to show you how martingales can be used to understand the convergence of empirical distributions to the true distribution of random variables. Okay, so this is going to be a very important topic in uh, machine learning, right? We know that the essence of machine learning is trying to estimate the underlying distribution. If we know the underlying distribution, we're good to go, right? Unsupervised learning is all about density estimation, estimating the underlying distribution. Using the examples using the samples we get from these underlying distributions, we wanted to understand what is the true distribution. We wanted to estimate the true distribution. And here I'm proposing a very naive way, which is using the empirical distribution, which is just a distribution function, which is just simply uh, calculate the frequency of observing values at most X in our sample, right? This is a very simple way of doing estimation. Now, you know, it seems to be very complicated to understand how this empirical distribution converts to the true distribution, but using martingale inequality with this very, uh, it, it's a little bit complicated to understand, but you know, if you go back and, um, you know, review it again, I'm sure you will get it, right? Uh, even, you know, I'm, some of you may already understand it very well, but in case you haven't, um, going back and review it, I'm sure it's gonna be easy for you, but the, the the message here I wanted to say is that you will be able to understand the convergence of these empirical distributions to the true distributions, which is a very important topic in machine learning. And now I'm trying to justify why you guys need to learn martingales, although it's a little bit complicated. Yeah, so here uh, someone is saying, what does it mean to condition on the sigma field? So remember, what is the sigma field? It's the smallest event, right? That is uh, rendering like, you know, the, that, can, that, that you can use to generate the random variables. So essentially, you know, if you have a sigma of x1 through xn minus one, for x1 and xn minus one being independent iid. So basically you can imagine that they are, they are just the random variables themselves in terms of the conditional expectation. You can you know, um, think of it that way, right? So expectation of ln condition on the sigma field of x1 through xn is nothing but expectation of ln condition on the random variables themselves, x1 through xn. Okay, so that's why I spend a lot of time trying to review the sigma fills and, you know, uh, during the last lecture or the one before. So um, if you still are a little bit confused, um, go back and look at the lecture, um, look at just slides and also feel free to ask questions on Piazza. Okay. Okay, wonderful. So I'm gonna move forward. 
Right, so we're finally here for this pack model. We've spent a lot of time preparing us to understand this concept better, uh, but I think it's worth it because the tools that we've been reviewing are going to be very important for us to read papers, to digest concepts. So now um, things are much um, you know, more conceptual rather than mathematical, right? So what is the motivation we're learning PAC model? So pro probably approximately correct learning. So what does that mean, right? So we care about guarantees. So what is the title of this course? It's algorithms in machine learning guarantees and analysis, right? So why do we care about guarantees? Why do we care about analysis? So here is some motivation. So some, you know, computational learning questions. Basically, as a computer science major, we care a lot about learning efficiency, right? As a machine learning uh, researcher, you also care about learning, right? So, so what can be learned efficiently, right? Can you design a um, exponential time algorithm or can you design a polynomial time algorithm, it makes a huge difference if you are working in a high dimensional space, which is usually the case in modern machine learning, right? So your data usually lies in a very high dimensional space. If your complexity is exponential in terms of the dimension, then it is very difficult. It's, you know, MP hard, it, it could be intractable. Right, so you care about efficiency very much. So here, wanted to, you know, motivate this question: What can be learned efficiently? What is inherently hard to learn? All right, and can you have a general model of learning? You know, what is the learning theory behind it? Right, in terms of complexity, everyone is familiar with computational complexity. You know, it involves time and space. What is your time complexity? What is the space complexity? How much memory would you take, right? And then there is another concept which is more statistical, which is the sample complexity. So sample complexity basically means the amount of training data needed to learn successfully. So what do I mean by learning successfully, right? Also, you know, some of you might agree that the mistake bounds is very important because I don't want to make mistakes, right? I wanted to make as few mistakes as I can before I learn successfully. This is very important for high stakes um, to tasks, right? You just cannot fail, right? If you fail, it's going to be catastrophic. So you just cannot fail. So we wanted to understand the guarantees of these algorithms. We wanted to understand the number of mistakes before you learn successfully. Okay, so these are if indeed the motivations. Is a in this context, would learning basically be modeling like the similar similar? Well, we'll see. Yeah, that's a very good question, and I'm happy that I successfully motivated you. So we'll see what learning means in this learning theory framework, okay? But first, I wanted to define some notations so we're um, on the same page. All right, so first I wanted to, again, uh, denote the all possible instances or examples. So you can imagine that X is your input space, okay? So it is a space. So for example, it's the set of all images characterized by their pixel values. Right. So it is going to be a space. So let's say you have an X. Now, I wanted to introduce this concept of target concept. So what does this mean? This means that it is going to be a map, an underlying map uh, that maps your input space to the label space. So in this example here, I'm just using a binary classification 0, 1 for simplicity. But for other things, you can, you know, similarly generalize to other settings, regression, multi-label classification, multi-class classification, and so on, right? So you can, you know, similarly generalize this to that, but I wanted to 
first focus on the simplest case, which is a binary classification. You have a label 0, 1. Okay, so this is called the target concept. It is hidden. It is the underlying process that's happening within your data, but you have no control over it and you cannot observe it. So you can also imagine that your target concept in this binary case can be identified by its support. What does that mean? It means that the collection of examples X that are within the input instance such that the target concept would map the X to one. Okay, so this is the entire collection of X that are mapping to one. What does this remind you? It's like a decision boundary, right? But decision boundary is what we are trying, you know, what our design classifier, uh, whereas here is the true, so you can imagine this is the true decision boundary, right? It is the underlying uh, process that is separating the input space into zero and one, right? Because, you know, for this space, it's gonna map it to zero. For the other space, it's gonna map it to one. So that's why what we say by identify is support. So it's a collection of examples in the input space that is mapped to one. Okay. So I'm here using like, you know, the entire set of images that are actually cats, right? So now the concept class, uh, this is just a capital C. Um, it is just a set of target concepts. That's easy to understand. Uh, and I don't want everyone to bug on that for now. Okay, so more importantly is the target distribution. What is the target distribution? It's oftentimes, you know, what you guys call the underlying distribution that the data is generated from. So capital D, the target distribution, is a fixed probability distribution over the input space X. Okay, so traditionally, you know, you guys are familiar, like the training and test examples are all drawn according to this distribution. It is often unknown. And the challenge of machine learning tasks is often that you don't know this distribution D. Okay. However, you know, recently modern machine learning transfer learning domain adaptation, this D could be different for training or test, right? Now, what is a training sample? So here I'm gonna use S to denote a training sample. And it actually, one training sample includes M training examples. So this is very important. Sometimes we mix samples and examples. So sample is just a collection of examples. So why do I wanted to distinguish them? Sometimes you are you know, for example, the training accuracy is based on one sample because it's based on your training exam, uh, training sample, right? It has a few examples, but it's based on your training sample. But sometimes you wanted to take an additional expectation over the sample. So you wanted to, you can imagine you can take, you can sample from the underlying distribution for many times. So you can get a collection of data, um, training data sets, right? But that's why I wanted to distinguish the two. You, you know, you have a training sample, you have many training examples within a training sample. Okay? Any questions? Okay, so this, you know, these are very um, important concepts. I wanted to take the time to explain it so we don't have to go back to this again. All right? So capital H, I'm going to use it to denote the set of concept hypotheses, right? So um, what does that mean? This basically means that I have a set of hypotheses that I'm going to um, put on to estimate the underlying target concept. So Laura is asking, so S is a subset of X? Yes, so X is the entire input space, right? So S is basically M 
independent, so usually it's IID, right? So it's M IID samples from the underlying distribution D. It will be a subset of capital X. Yes, you're right. Okay, so going back to the hypothesis, uh, set of concept hypotheses, um, do we have another question? Is H basically the set of functions mapping X to C? Uh, it is, but more importantly, it is your hypothesis. Okay, so what I mean by that is, for example, if you have, so just forget about all of this. Let's say you have a, um, you know, a target concept, right? The target concept is mapping some underlying, uh, it's, it's mapping from the input space to the output, to the label space. Okay, so that's fine. We have that. But now, you know, without telling you any information about it, I will say, so everyone, please estimate this target concept C. What would you start? You know, some of you might start with a linear uh, classifier. Some of you might, you know, because you wanted to, you know, see whether a linear classifier would successfully estimate this target concept or not. But some of you would believe in neural networks. You wanted to throw a ResNet 32 um, to estimate the underlying um, target concept. So the so for those of you who are using linear classifiers, actually you've decided that your set of hy uh, concept hypotheses is just the set of all linear classifiers. Okay, so it's a collection of hypothesis. Each hypothesis is just a linear classifier, but you are using the collection of all linear classifier as the set of concept hypotheses. Okay, so it includes, you know, any linear classifier. So that's your hypothesis set. Whereas for those of you who are using, you know, ResNet 32 without uh, knowing what is the parameter, what is the value of the weights of the neural network, then you are using all possible ResNet 32, right? So based on different values, these weights can take, you're using all sets of ResNet 32. And essentially your hypothesis that is just the ResNet 32. Okay, so that's my explanation about the set of concept hypothesis. Sometimes I'll see that's hypothesis set, right? So capital H is used, often used to denote this hypothesis set. So now what's very important is that this learning algorithm, so you have a learning algorithm, right? You can use whatever learning algorithm you use in machine learning, but your learning algorithm receives sample S. So usually it would observe one training data set. So it's going to be one sample S, right? The sample is usually IID, um, but of course, you know, not necessarily always true. So you receive the sample S and you select a hypothesis, HS. So it's one hypothesis, right? So this algorithm will tell you which hypothesis is the best within capital H, the hypothesis set that best approximates this underlying C. Okay, so what does that mean? Let's say you have a linear classifier. That's gonna be your hypothesis set. You have all the set of all linear classifiers as your capital H. Now you want to learn a specific linear classifier. What is the coefficient, right? You learn the coefficient for that linear classifier and that is gonna be your H of S. Why is H of S? Because your, your coefficients is learned based on this sample S, right? You're based on this training examples, you're learning these coefficients. So that's why it's H of S. It's your hypothesis that you learned from your set of hypothesis set, capital H. And what is your goal? Your goal is really to approximate C, right? So then what do you mean by approximate C? Some of you might ask. What do you mean by approximate C? So now, ready to define the errors. So on that last slide. Okay. Does like a soft max type thing does not fit on this because it doesn't give you C, it gives you a distribution. The soft max thing should also, you know, fit on this. You know, you can consider the entire thing, 
because no, even if you're using softmax, you are selecting argmax, right? You're using argmax to finally map to the label space. So I'm talking about the entire process, end-to-end -end process. You are talking about a part of the process, which is from the input to the softmax. I'm including everything. Does that make sense? Okay, thanks. Sure. Okay, so now what do I mean by approximating C, right? So here comes the errors. Everyone knows errors, right? So everyone knows like, you know, uh, accuracy error, zero one error. You know, when you use neural nets, you have cross entropy loss, you have like, you know, um, I don't know what else, uh, you know, squared loss and things like that, right? So, so what is errors, right? to be very formal uh, you have like this true error which is essentially what we're all trying to uh, minimize for a supervised learning task you have the true error sometimes you call it generalization error so what is it so the generalization error of a hypothesis you know now i'm just using h but you could imagine this is just h of s right so just for simplicity I'm just saying a hypothesis, right? So it doesn't have to relate to a specific sample, but usually it is related to a specific sample. But anyway, I can evaluate any hypothesis H within my capital H maybe, right? So with respect to the target concept C and a underlying distribution. So very importantly, you without a C, capital C, you cannot evaluate H without a distribution D, you cannot also evaluate the generalization error of H. So what is that? I'm going to use capital R of H to denote the true error or the generalization error. Okay, so I will use that along the lectures. So I will not explain it again. Whenever I, I, I use this capital R of H, it's going to be the true error, the generalization error of H. So what is it defined? It's defined as the probability of x drawn from the underlying distribution. So x drawn from the d. Right? You don't know what d is, but anyway, you're trying to evaluate the probability of x drawn from d of the probability that, that hx is not c of x. Okay, so that's going to be your true error or your generalization error. Any questions? Okay. Any, okay, so now what is it? Because it's just a probability of an event, hx not equal to cx, then apparently is nothing but an expectation of this indicator function, right? That is easy to see. Expectation of this indicator function of whether you've made a mistake on this specific example. But you're taking expectation over all examples drawn from D. Okay, so this part, it is on a specific example X, but you're taking expectation over the X. Okay, so that's easy. I mean, some of you might already get bored <laughs> because you've already seen generalization error. You don't, you know, uh, need to see that again. But I'll promise you uh, the notations. Sometimes I, I've seen a lot of papers using sloppy notations. Um, I wanted to make sure that you know everyone who taken this course won't use these sloppy notation. You'll use precise notations that won't cause confusion. Okay. So empirical error. What is the empirical error? It is the average error of. Um, sorry, is there any question? So Lara is asking, is HX or CX the true label? CX is the true label. C is the target concept. It's the underlying thing that you don't know. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. So empirical error, coming back to empirical error, is the average error of H, right? So H is any hypothesis, again, on the training sample S, right? So it is specifically on a specific training sample. That's why it's called empirical error drawn according to distribution D. So each example in that training sample is drawn IID from D. 
So usually you would denote it as hat of RS evaluated for this H, right? So this uh, S is denoting this training sample, whereas this hat is you know, trying to tell you this is an empirical error. So what is it? It is essentially is X from this empirical distribution. So I'll, I'll explain, actually, um, you know, let's first not see what it is yet, but of course, similarly to this, it's gonna be the probability of X drawn from some distribution. Now it is not D, but D hat um, of this event of HX not equal to CX. So this is similar, but the only difference here is that here, this is the D hat, whereas here, this is D. Okay, so what is D hat? Yeah, D, D hat is, well, it's related to D, but uh, related to S, but it's not exactly S, right? So D hat is an empirical distribution. It basically, so the support of the D hat, so you know what values can take are essentially the values of these axes, of these examples. And then the distribution essentially, all of them are um, with an equal, you know, distribution. You know, they can take probability one over M because you have M limited number of examples Right, so you have m examples. Each of them appear once, so the frequency is just one over m, and those are the empirical distribution. Okay, yeah, empirical distribution on s. So that's why you use one over m here. So you're doing an unweighted average over all the examples because each of them take probability one over m. Does that? Make sense? Yes, exactly. So Juan, you're right. Hat of dx equals to one over m for x in s. That's absolutely right. That's a very good, um, you know, uh, explanation. I'll I'll write it here. Okay. So d hat of x equals to one over m for x uh, in s. Okay? Yeah, thank oh, you Juan. That's question. very good explanation. So, okay, any so, questions? Yeah, uh, so here why can't I uh, uh, take x my uh, my examples from s and calculate this error like average of that error would also give me one over m summation i could like yeah, this exactly it becomes the average right yeah so they're equivalent i'm using like from the ex you know i'm using the um perspective of an empirical distribution which is a different perspective than empirical average but this is more like a statistical perspective in terms of understanding uh, the empirical error. Uh, should uh, should the summation be from i equals one to m, uh, or else it should be one over m plus one? Yes, one. Typo. Yeah. Or you know you can say this is m plus one if it's i from zero to m. <laughs> So Yue Ling is asking, shouldn't the numerator, numerator of the number of times x appears in s, uh, what does that mean? I guess the notation is, is okay. S could have, um, could contain duplicate values, right? So I guess x here just means an element one example from s instead of a specific value right 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 true so you know so yeah this xi is just one example oh 
wow, this is already end. Oh, I didn't finish um, many of the slides. So let me just finish this last sentence. Um, okay, so sorry, what's your question again? You're asking the XI. XI is one training example. Oh, actually XI, Y is one training example, right? Or actually to be more specific is gonna be XI. C of XI is one training example. Yeah, I have the same question, mm -hmm. which is basically just shouldn't capital S be a multi-set because you can have the same sample multiple times. Yeah, you can, you can, yes, yeah. Okay, um, yeah, true. So you can have the same sample multiple times, that's true. But are we okay? All right, so let me finish the last one. I just wanted to mention that again, so this R of H is gonna be an expectation of this empirical error. So this is the empirical error, right? So as I mentioned before, you can, have, you can take expectation over different samples to get the true error because the empirical error is dependent on this S here, which is one draw right from the underlying distribution you wanted to have you know many draws so you wanted to take expectation over s and this s dm is a very common notation for uh writing like you know you have a sample each of the example are drawn from the d from the underlying distribution d and the sample have m such examples so this is the common notation you would use okay so, all right, so I'll still upload the slides um, to, you know, to the, to the um, web page, um, but we'll have to continue the rest of the slides next time. All right, thank you everyone. This is a good lecture. Just one comment. Uh, okay. Everybody, please check my Piazza post regarding the course project because there is some confusion about signups and people were signing up under different tabs. Um, so just see my Piazza post, please, so we can all be on the same page. Thank you. Okay, wonderful. And another reminder is, um, you know, the potential list of projects are almost um, done, right? So I put that on chat, uh, the link, just to remind everyone, a reminder to everyone that the uh, descriptions are mostly in. Um, I've tried my best to put as many papers as possible. So uh, if you're interested in some of the projects, please, um, you know, and, and you have questions, please contact me. Okay. All right. Wonderful. See you, everyone. Have a good one.